Let's again come before God in prayer. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable, O Lord, in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. God's voice. We heard it throughout the scriptures that John read this morning. God's voice has an effect on everything. No place is beyond the reach of the voice of God. Listen to the gospel as I read from Matthew chapter 3 about the baptism of Jesus. And I ask you to listen for God's voice in this passage. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan River to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came out up from the water, Suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and resting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And a voice from heaven said, or the voice of God said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. All three of our scriptures today say something about God's voice. Let's go back to Psalm 29, our responsive reading this morning, which demonstrates the ultimate power, the ultimate power of God's word. The psalmist focused the attention of the reader squarely on what matters most here, and that is the voice of the Lord. Six times in the 11 verses of this psalm, the divine voice, God's voice, and its impact are the center of attention. And so what does Psalm 29 have to say to us about this voice? And by extension then, about the Lord whose voice it is. Well, we read, the voice thunders over the waters. The voice shatters trees and lays forests bare. It causes earthquakes and shoots forth flame. The voice shakes the wilderness and levels mountains. Now, if you think like I do, there is really nothing evidently comforting or comfortable about this particular voice. It sounds rather destructive. Here is a God whose very voice is laced with all the terrifying power of fire, earthquake, and flood. And we can't help today but be reminded of the devastating forest fires in Australia and the earthquake in the Caribbean. How do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of these things if God's voice um, demands or commands this to happen? If we look at the end of the psalm, though, at the last couple of verses, Psalm 29 ends with a picture of the calm not before the storm, but the calm after the storm. This particular psalm is a passage that shows us that God is in control, enthroned as sovereign, as ruler over all creation. And God is the one who gives to his people blessings of peace and blessings of strength. We see this evidence in our reading from Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 43 addresses a people who have been in exile in Babylon and will now be making their way back home. There are people who 
have been hurt, who have had terrible trials, and now God is saying to them a promise of assurance. God promised to guide the community back home. The community itself would survive. And here again is where we hear God's voice, because it was the Lord who created, who says, Do not be afraid. I will save you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are precious to me, and I love you and give you honor. Do not be afraid, because I am with you. Like the people of Israel, the contemporary church is assured of God's presence along our journey. But it does not suggest that God's people have a guarantee against trials and risks and dangers. We can still remember the damage of hurricanes, particularly Hurricanes Harvey and Katrina. People did not pass safely through the waters. And fires of various kinds have done extensive damage, and earthquakes have created chaos. God's voice shakes the heavens and the earth and brings both destruction and creation. And God's voice also provides strength and peace. For God says, do not be afraid, I am with you. The emphasis on the power of the voice of God in Psalm 29 and Isaiah 43 stands as an ideal foundation for the baptism of Jesus. The God whose voice is powerful and full of majesty breaks open the heavens in our gospel reading to announce the identity of the man from Galilee who has emerged from the waters of the Jordan River. God has once again entered our story through spoken words, and in doing so, affects the character and the direction of the story. Naming, giving someone a name, affects relationship, and a changed relationship changes reality. In the context of Jesus' baptism, we discover a voice from heaven seeking to bestow a name on Jesus. God says, this is my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The voice of the Lord speaks, a name is given, and both relationship and reality are changed forever. Here is the most intimate statement of Jesus' identity we will find anywhere in Scripture. And perhaps it is also a clue to our identity. In a world filled with all kinds of voices, God gives us a new name, a new identity, and gives it as a gift. We too are the beloved. This new identity has profound implications for the way we understand our lives. There's nothing we can do that will cause God to stop loving us. There, no, there are no prerequisites. It has nothing to do with how worthy we are. Nothing will cause God's love to be taken away. Instead, we get the invitation, one that we are free to embrace or one that we are free to ignore. God invites us to trust in the gift, in the gift of love, to trust in the active, unconditional love God has for each one of us. Every time we listen with great attentiveness to God's voice calling us the beloved, we will discover within ourselves a desire to hear that voice more deeply. We will long to hear it more often. As soon as we catch a glimpse of this truth, we are put on a journey in search of the fullness of that truth. From the moment we claim the truth of being the beloved, 
we are faced with the call to become who we are. Becoming the beloved means letting the truth of our belovedness become real in everything we think, in everything we say, in everything we do. In the common places of our daily living, in our homes, in our friendships, in our families, in our churches, in our communities, the voice is always there. When life becomes difficult, when the way grows dark, when we hurt and fail one another or lose someone we love, when faith grows dim, when our work grows wearisome, we face an uncertain future. When we lift our hands to the heavens in fear or pain, the voice is always there. You are my beloved, gifted by my spirit, called and sent to join me at work in the world. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Beloved is our name, and that makes all the difference. But God's unconditional love for us can sometimes be hard for us to trust. And we need each other to remind us of that love and to help us to trust it. We forget so quickly that we are God's beloved children and allow the many curses of our world to darken our hearts. Therefore, we have to be reminded of our belovedness and remind others of theirs. To remind each other that we are loved and that's what the church is supposed to be. We call ourselves the body of Jesus Christ. And as the body of Christ, we are the beloved community. Just as God looked at Jesus and said, this is my beloved, God looks at the church and says the same thing. So if we are the beloved community, what does that look like, or what should that look like? Martin Luther King Jr. had a vision of a beloved community that I think is so in keeping with what we are focusing on here today. Dr. King's beloved community is a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth. In the beloved community, poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of human decency will not allow it. Racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be replaced by an all-conclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. We can understand this in a global way, but also in a more personal way. It all comes down to relationships and how we treat each other. Being a Christ-centered community, being this beloved community, means we not only see ourselves as Christ sees us, as beloved by God, but that we see each other as beloved by God as well. We are the beloved community, and each of us is a beloved child of God. And so let us hear the voice of God speaking to us today. Amen.